Um, are we recording? Yeah, it has been recorded. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah, okay, so we are ready to go. Uh, let me uh, welcome um, Guido Indens uh, from Stanford. Uh, thank you very much, Guido, for joining. Uh, and I'd like to welcome Oliver Linton from, um, from my own department in Cambridge. Uh, very pleased to see you, Oliver. Haven't seen you for a long time. <laughs> and uh, uh, we have an hour. Uh, please, uh, Oliver, please introduce uh, Guido. Uh, real pleasure to have uh, both of you. Uh, thank you very much, Guido, for joining. Uh, Great, thank you very much. So it's my honor and pleasure to introduce the plenary speaker, Guido Imbens. He is the Applied Econometrics Professor and Professor of Economics at the Graduate School of Business at Stanford University, where he has been since 2012. Before that, he was Professor of Economics at Harvard, 2006 to 2012. He was also, uh, before that, pro uh, Professor at Berkeley and UCLA, and before that, it's ancient history, so we, we won't go into that. Uh, he has, of course, had an outstanding research career uh, with many awards and fellowships, American Academy of Arts and Science, Econometric Society, uh, honorary doctorate at St. Gallen. Um, and he's made major contribution to the profession through editing and uh, invited lectures and uh, conference organization. Um, so his major research contribution has been in defining and measuring causal effect um, in economics and other areas of statistics. Uh, and he's had a major uh, role in pushing this forward uh, to uh, the applied areas. Uh, and he's, um, uh, a lot of work has been done on matching and instrumental variables and Bayesian inference. Uh, by himself and also uh, with Donald Rubin and Joshua Angris, they have uh, managed to bring the best out of each other and produce a fantastic uh, research program. So very happy to hand over now to Kido to talk about uh, causal models for panel data. All right, um, thanks very much, uh, Oliver, for that very kind uh, introduction. Um, so let me... Um, See if I can share my screen. Okay, so does does that work? Uh, so I'm not hearing any uh, concerns. So so I take it I'm sharing my screen now. Um, first of all, I should say this is uh, the joint work uh, with with uh, working. Okay, good. With uh, Dmitry Akarelsky, uh, who's at uh, at Samfi and was uh, a student here at Stanford uh, earlier, um, and so so as Oliver said, I've spent a large part of my career working on the questions of uh, of causality, and this paper kind of fits in that uh, that line of uh, of research. So here, what we want to do is uh, is look at uh, panel data settings. Uh, I'm going to bring some new issues into the discussion there. So we're actually going to propose some uh, some new estimators and, and have some uh, results for them. But it's sort of really a bigger uh, agenda where the big picture is that uh, in these panel data settings, uh, we've often, much of the literature has, has focused on building models uh, for the outcome uh, data Whereas in other parts of the causal inference literature, uh, people have spent, put a lot of effort into uh, modeling the assignment uh, mechanism, kind of starting with randomized experiments, but then kind of generalizing that, uh, looking at uh, methods uh, under selectionally uh, observables or unconfoundedness. Uh, uh, and in that literature, people have found that, uh, that bringing in these design issues, bringing in uh, models for the assignment mechanism can be very helpful in improving uh, the estimators, uh, making them more robust uh, and making them have better uh, finite sample properties. Uh, and we wanna bring those ideas kind of uh, to bear on, uh, on panel data settings. And we'll see that there's a bunch of, uh, of additional issues, but at, uh, at an abstract level, kind of thinking about modeling the assignment mechanism in addition to or partly instead of uh, focusing just on the 
models for the outcome data can be uh, can be helpful. I'm going to uh, discuss some ideas on uh, on how to do that. So the starting point, um, and I, to be, I'm going to largely uh, look at an even simpler setting, but we're going to look at a setting where we have outcomes uh, for a number of units uh, indexed uh, by i, running from 1 to, uh, to n, over a number of periods, uh, t running from 1 to t. And we uh, have observations uh, on a... Uh, and we typically going to look at a binary treatment, uh, but there's some results for for more general cases. We're interested in the effect of some binary treatment on the on the outcome, uh, and we want to exploit the fact that we have panel data where kind of both the where the treatment varies uh, across individuals, uh, varies by i, as well as uh, varies over time. Uh, so we, even within uh, individuals within units, uh, there's variation in the in the treatment. Uh, and so in that setting, uh, and so what we're going to be interested in is, is the treatment effect uh, denoted here by tau. We're going to allow for variation uh, there in the treatment effect. We're not necessarily going to assume it's, uh, it's constant, uh, but kind of a common uh, approach uh, to doing so, to trying to estimate uh, tau, some, some average treatment effect or some common treatment effect in the such settings, uh, is to uh, to use a two-way fixed effect uh, setup where you allow for unit-specific uh, components uh, in the outcome, for time-specific uh, components, uh, so the unit-specific components are alpha i's here, time-specific components are lambda t. There may be the time unit-specific covariance xit, uh, but the main thing is um, uh, this this uh, indicator WIT uh, for the treatment term. We're interested in the causal effect uh, of uh, of that, and uh, this two way fixed effect uh, approach is a very common way to uh, to estimate that. Now, kind of, if you think about the difference with cross section settings, uh, where we don't have the time dimension uh, in a cross section setting, typically what we would end up doing is is somehow comparing treated and control units uh, and we would use various methods to uh, to make sure those uh, those units are comparable in the relevant aspects and so leading way of doing that is assuming selection on uh, observables and so we would compare treated and control units uh, with the the same value of the of the covariates uh, we try to look at compare treated and control units that are similar as possible you can go beyond that sometimes. Uh, kind of instrumental variables uh, methods fit into that framework, but it's a big literature where essentially we're trying to make these units as comparable as possible, uh, and then uh, compare treated and control units. But with panel data, we actually have a fundamentally more uh, different setting where we have a choice in what type of uh, comparisons we can make. We can do the same thing. Uh, as we do in uh, in cross section cases, namely compare two different units, unit I, unit J, at the same point in time, where one of these units is treated, one of them is is uh, is not treated. They're similar, say, in their their covariates, and they may also be similar in their history of uh, of the outcomes, uh, or in some other aspect. Uh, but we we can compare. We can still, just like in the cross section case we can compare units uh, at the same point in time uh, with different uh, units. What we can also do in the, the panel data setting, and that's distinct uh, and that's not possible in, from the cross, that's distinct from the cross-section setting, it's not possible there. We can compare outcomes for the same unit, but at different points in time. So if, a, if unit I is treated in period T, but in the control group in period S, we can compare their outcomes and possibly still with, with similar values of the covariates and, and possibly the similar in other the aspects, but we would fundamentally be doing a different comparison where instead of within time across units, we now do a comparison across time within the units. And the first thing I want to point out is that often the models we use, the models on the outcomes, like the this two-way fixed effect model, uh, allows you to do a bit of both. 
you kind of by taking out by differencing things we get rid of the alpha highs by differencing over time we get rid of the lambda t's and then we can make any comparison of treated and controlled uh, units uh, and that would be valid for the estimating uh, tau so that's that's kind of the first point i want to make so the, the, with panel data we, we can make fundamentally different comparisons because uh, we we can now also compare the same unit uh, over time my second point here, I want to step back and, and go uh, look at the cross-section uh, setting again. And I want to look at this setting where we're interested in just estimating an average treatment effect, uh, assuming uh, unconfoundedness. Uh, there's a huge literature on, uh, on that kind of starting, kind of the model version of that started uh, with the um, Rosenbaum Rubin propensity score paper, but it's sort of lots of, of more parametric things people were doing uh, the prior to that uh, and since then there have been a lot of uh, uh, there's, there's been a lot of theoretical uh, research doing this as well as a huge number of uh, of applications uh, and the the modern literature is focused particularly on cases where x is high dimensional uh, and that, that creates all sorts of uh, uh, complications but sort of here the general uh, the approach in that literature is that we can uh, look at the conditional uh, outcome uh, mean, we can estimate that, we can build a model for that, and we can build a model for the probability of being treated, uh, the propensity score. And if you're interested in estimating tau, we can do that by either focusing on, uh, on this model or we can focus on this model uh, or, or we can do both. And so kind of there's, there's three general classes of, uh, of estimators and they don't, they're not, not all the estimators that people actually use here. And there's a huge number of them fit in neatly in this class. But here, when I kind of think of this as just there being three types of estimators, we can just estimate the two conditional means and average the difference. We can just estimate the propensity score and uh, reweight the observations, uh, or we can do both. Uh, and kind of the this double robust uh, approaches and they they go back some of them to uh, work by pickle and uh, uh, robbins uh, and it's in the more recent uh, high dimensional case uh, there's a lot of work by uh, victor chanosikov in this uh, this area the the general sense of the literature at the moment is that these doubly robust estimators are very attractive uh, they uh, they don't rely on having a good model for the conditional outcomes for the muse uh, was as long as the propensity score is estimated well this um, this this estimate is still going to be consistent and similarly even if the propensity score is estimated poorly as long as mu1 and mu0 are estimated well this estimate is going to have uh, good properties and kind of more more generally if both of them are misspecified but not too much there's a sense in which the, the, the error is proportional to the error in, the, in both these components. Uh, and so by estimating both, you may do better than, uh, than using these estimators that only use a model for the outcomes or only use a model for the, the propensity score. And so what we want to do here in this, uh, this paper, kind of more, more generally in these settings, we want to see if we can do the same thing there, uh, namely modeling both the outcomes and modeling the assignment, uh, modeling the process that determines the value of, uh, of the treatment uh, and combine those in a way that brings out the, the best of, uh, of both. And so it's going to be a little trickier here because unlike in the cross-section case and our unconfoundedness, uh, here we want to directly allow for unobserved uh, covariates, uh, unobserved characteristics of the individuals that uh, invalidate simple comparisons of uh, of treated and control units. And so, as a result, uh, as a result, kind of of, of these endogeneity type problems, kind of simple matching or uh, adjusting for observable differences is no longer sufficient. Uh, 
And so what, what, what most of the literature has focused on is this building the sometimes very complex models for the outcomes uh, that, that connect the outcomes uh, to the unobservables uh, in a way that somehow allows us to adjust for those. Uh, and what we're going to do is, is augment that as, uh, with an assignment model and see whether we can uh, create more robust uh, methods uh, by doing so the same way or in the same spirit as that was done in the, the cross-section case. And so, so kind of to, to preview kind of the, the main insights, uh, let me look at a very simple example. Uh, and so first, kind of, um, and just kind of think about why we can't simply compare treated and uh, control outcomes for treated and control units. Uh, so if we just look at the, the a treat a unit that was treated in period T, say unit I treated in period T, and we compare that the outcome uh, yit to the outcome for unit j in period s where that where unit j in period s was not treated we think that such a comparison doesn't give a it isn't unbiased for the treatment effect uh, isn't doesn't give us an estimate of, of a causal effect then uh, we think that that the key reason is that there's some unobserved uh, variable u that is different between treated and control units. And so simply comparing uh, outcomes for treated unit peri and periods uh, to outcomes for, for control units and periods uh, is not going to be adequate uh, if there is this unobserved variable u that is both related to the treatment and related to, uh, to the outcomes. Uh, and so how do we... Uh, how, what can we do to uh, to deal with that? Uh, one common, uh, well, it's a, it's a, arguably uh, most of the literature tries to address this by modeling uh, the outcomes. And so again, back kind of to this to, to this two way fixed effect uh, setup. Uh, suppose uh, we specify a linear additive linear model uh, for the outcomes, where there's an where the unobserved component comes in additively. There's also a time uh, uh, fixed effect beta t, and then there's the treatment effect, and there's an epsilon it that is uh, just noise. Then under this model, if we're willing to take to make this uh, make the assumption that this model is valid for the outcome data, then what we uh, can do is look for the uh, two units, the uh, i and j and look for two time periods T and S, such that unit I is treated in period T, but unit I is not treated in period S. And, um, sorry, this should be a zero. Uh, unit J is not treated in period T or period S. And in that case, taking this double difference gives us an unbiased estimator for tau. And so that's great. And, and what, I, what is particularly important here is that uh, this approach does not rely on making any assumptions about the relationship between the WIT and this unobserved covariate. It can, there can be uh, completely flexible, uh, we're robust to any, any uh, relationship between uh, those two variables. The key thing here is that we need to make uh, arguably uh, restrictive set of assumptions on the on the outcomes uh, but we don't need to make any assumptions on the assignment uh, process and this uh, this this gives us a very common way of trying to estimate the treatment effect in these panel data settings now we can do something uh, very different to try to get uh, at uh, at the treatment effect uh, tau suppose we're willing to make uh, a strong assumption on the assignment process. Uh, and so here we kind of made a very simple assumption that whether unit I is treated in period T depends on two things, uh, noise component, uh, new IT, and this unobserved covariate UI. And it's just whether UI is, is above or below a threshold uh, determines whether the unit I 
is treated or not in uh, in period t and so if we make if we make that assumption and we don't make any assumptions about the relationship between yit and uh, ui other than kind of ui is the reason we have endogeneity here uh, then we can do a different uh, type of comparison we can compare unit uh, i and unit j uh, in period t if unit i is treated in that period and unit j is uh, in the control group in that period as long as the total number of times unit i is treated is the same as the total number of times the unit j is treated and the reason is the conditional on the uh, uh, this equality there's nothing in the distribution of ui that is informative it's, uh, no, there's nothing in the distribution of wit that is informative about uh, ui and so the conditional distribution of ui and it's the same as the conditional distribution of uj uh, given this restriction and so by conditioning on the the fraction of treated periods for unit i being the same as the fraction of treated periods for unit j the, there's no relationship between the wit and uh, and ui within that set and as a result we can directly compare the, the outcome for unit i and the outcome for unit j and that comparison the, is gives us an unbiased estimate of uh, of tau and so here what we've done essentially the opposite of, of what we did on the, what i did on the previous slide now we build a model for the for the assignment and we were we we're completely uh, agnostic about the relationship between the outcomes and the the unobserved covariate ui and we still get a the consistent or sort of an unbiased way of estimating tau and if we make enough of these comparisons we can get a consistent estimator there and so what the what the general plan is now is uh, as as follows we're going to build a model for the for the outcomes uh, and given that model there's going to be a whole set of estimators that works given that model right so here kind of i'm going to denote that set by the script t the index by outcome the given that outcome model as long as we choose an estimator in that uh, in that set of estimators we're going to be consistent for uh, for tau and at the same time we're going to uh, build a model for the assignment and a set of estimators that is consistent under that model the uh, the uh, and we're going to call that uh, script t the design and then what we're going to do uh, to get this double robustness uh, property we're going to look at estimators that are in the intersection of those two sets and because they're in the the, the outcome set they're going to be valid if the model for the outcomes is going to be uh, is is correct and if because they're in the the set that is consistent under the design assumptions they were going to be uh, consistent if the model for the the assignment process is uh, is consistent and so back to, back to that simple example what we're going to do now is to look for unit pair of units i and j a pair of time periods s and t such that this first set of restrictions holds and so now the double difference is valid uh, under the outcome model but we're also going to insist that these two units i uh, and j satisfies this this additional restriction namely that the fraction of treated periods uh, for the two is the same and that implies the comparisons of unit i and uh, and unit sorry, sorry this is again be zero and so the second restriction implies that we can just compare unit i and unit j at the same time the first set of restrictions implies that the double difference is uh, is valid and so if we impose both restrictions estimators that, that are averages um, of uh, over the uh, double differences of this type 
estimate is that uh, averages of, of double differences of that type are going to be unbiased uh, for tau if as long as the outcome model holds or the assignment model holds uh, but they don't they don't need to rely on both and so in cases where we're we're willing to think about the uh, model for the assignment we can uh, reduce the sensitivity the reliance on the model for the outcome because there's there's going to be some price to pay for that uh, by imposing the second set of restrictions relative to only imposing the first set of restrictions uh, by adding the second set of restrictions uh, we're reducing the set of estimators we are considering and so if we look for the lowest variance in uh, in that set that it's that is typically going to be a uh, uh, that estimator is typically going to be less uh, precise than it would be if we uh, if we didn't impose that uh, that second restriction so there's going to be some price to pay for for uh, um, insisting on this uh, this robustness uh, um, in terms of uh, precision but so again can, well, what we want to do and I, now i'm going to go to the more general case but the principle is essentially going to be the same that we're going to look at uh, models for the outcomes that's going to imply a set of restrictions on the the estimators we can uh, we can use we're going to also look for a model for the assignment uh, that's going to apply a set of restrictions uh, the, on the estimators we can use and then we're going to look for for estimators uh, that are as precise as possible but that are in both sets uh, that are in the intersection of the the two sets uh, and that are going to be valid under the, as long as either of those models uh, holds in some sense if the um, so this, uh, this this is sort of the main example to give intuition for why for what what we're trying to do here we're trying to uh, make the estimators more, more robust by uh, ensuring that they're consistent under a model on the assignment uh, process where much of the literature has focused on um, estimators uh, whose consistency is tied uh, solely to a model for the for the outcomes and it's especially if we, if both the models are correct these estimators are likely to be uh, more robust in uh, in finite samples so now let me kind of look more generally uh, at what uh, what type of uh, assignment models and outcome models we may want to consider here and how we would go about figuring out what these sets look like and what uh, the, the intersection of uh, of these uh, these sets looks like so we'll look at a case where we have uh, we will observe a large number of units uh, and for uh, t periods uh, and the, the formal results I'm going to uh, focus on the case where t is uh, is fixed uh, and where the, the number of units is uh, is large we observe a number of outcomes uh, t outcomes for each unit uh, t treatment uh, variables for each uh, unit the um, the paper kind of deals uh, with the presence of uh, of covariates but that's that's not of the of the essence uh, here we're going to look mainly at the the case with the binary treatment uh, though again in the paper we, we talk and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, extensions to the the case where the treatment is non-binary uh, um and so the first thing we're going to assume is that the the um, outcomes depend only on the contemporaneous treatment rather than on the the whole path of the the treatment so there's there's no the even though there's correlation in the outcomes, there's no uh, dynamic uh, treatment effects. There's a very big literature kind of on the settings where the dynamics of the, the treatment effects is, uh, is very important. Uh, here, we're looking at a case where treating the unit in one particular period has an effect only on the outcome for that particular period and not uh, on, uh, on any future outcomes. And so as a result, we can, uh, uh, define the causal effects at the unit and time level just as the 
the difference between uh, two potential outcomes, YIT1 and uh, YIT0. And we're going to be interested in averages of tau IT, averages both over the units and, uh, and time periods. The second assumption, and this is really uh, key, and this, this is underlying a lot of the methods the, in panel data, though it's, it's not always uh, made explicit, uh, but we're going to assume that there's an unobserved the characteristic of, uh, of the unit, a fixed uh, time invariant characteristic UI, such that if, if we condition on that, we would have unconfounded this. Uh, so if, if we condition on that, we can compare treated and control units. Uh, we can compare treated units with control units uh, uh, to get a uh, valid uh, estimate of the of the causal effect. Uh, and so this is in itself not uh, not testable. Uh, we can always make it hold by just setting a UI equal to uh, to WI. But the the implication of this assumption is that as if we were to observe UI. And if we were to be able to, uh, to find the units with, the, with similar values of UI, we could compare them uh, across units. And this, this is fundamentally saying that we can compare the different units, some of which are in the treatment group and the, some of which are in the control group to get causal facts. And we are not solely restricted to comparing the same unit uh, over time. Again, kind of the, the two-way fixed effect model uh, implies this because the once you condition on the unit fixed effect, you uh, you can compare treated and control units. Uh, but this doesn't rely on on any functional form yet. Uh, this is just saying there's some set of variables, and as long as as long as we were to condition on those, we could compare the units that are that differ in that treatment uh, status. Now the reason this assumption is going to help us uh, is that we're also assuming that there's overlap, uh, that the probability of being in the treat in have any particular sequence of treated and control uh, assignments conditional on any value of U is, uh, uh, is strictly less than, uh, than one. So any sequence is possible for any value of uh, U. If it doesn't, if this doesn't hold, if there's some units with particular values of U that can never be in the treatment group or never in the control group, then obviously the making uh, flexible comparisons is going to be very, very hard. And this, in the cross-section literature, this is a very standard uh, assumption and this, there's essentially no way um, around that. So these, these, those are the, the key assumptions that we're going to maintain. And then in addition, we're going to build models for the outcomes relating the potential outcomes to the unobserved component and relating the assignment mechanism to the unobserved component. And to do that, it's kind of useful to uh, think of the set of possible values for these sequences of assignments, uh, WI. So remember, WI is this t-dimensional factor. It can take on at most two to the t different uh, uh, values. Uh, when I think of the matrix of uh, of support uh, for that uh, that random variable, uh, and so I mean, we'll look at at particular uh, rows of that uh, that support and what their probability is uh, in the in the population. Then I'm also going to look at at functions of the assignment mechanism, uh, and these are going to be some of the things we want to condition on. To make the to get rid of the assignment, the dependence of the assignment of on the unobserved variable u. So often these are going to be of the form the average assignment probability, sort of the average the fraction of of uh, assigned periods, or it may be something like how often the units uh, the change uh, treatment, uh, the sum of the product wit times wit minus one. Uh, but at the moment, these can be general functions of um, the assignment. Given that W is discrete, um, S is going to take on a finite number of uh, points of support, and we can define the same uh, thing as uh, for, for W itself. We can look at the conditional support of uh, W given uh, 
the, any value for s. Now, kind of let's let's look at the at the outcome models uh, the first. So suppose that the potential outcomes satisfy this this uh, additive the the structure where there's one component that depends on the unobserved unit characteristic. There's a time component, and then the treatment effect may vary in an unrestricted way with the, the, the with uh, with UI. And so, in particular, kind of if you look at the outcome given the control treatment uh, that has this additive uh, structure, and we could generalize that uh, to a factor model structure, but here, and kind of to, for to um, for expositional reasons, uh, it's easier to focus on the on the additive uh, setting. And so now let's look at a general class of estimators uh, that is uh, linear in the in the outcomes uh, with some weights that uh, depend that are functions of the assignment. Uh, and in the end, almost all the estimators that are considered in this literature have this uh, this form. You take an average of the treated outcomes and subtract an average of the of the control outcomes, and the weights depend on the the sequence of the the, the treatments, uh, but don't depend uh, directly on the on the outcomes. Now, and so so this is kind of this gives us the general class of estimators we're going to consider, and now we want to see given this outcome model, given the outcome model we started off with here, how should we restrict the set of weights so that uh, the estimator estimates some well-defined average effect uh, given the, the outcome model. And so here's the set of restrictions we want to impose on these, uh, these weights. We uh, want to ensure that the sum of the weights for the treated is, uh, is equal to one, the sum of the weights for the controls is equal to minus one, so that we end up with a weighted average of treated outcomes minus a weighted average of control outcomes with both sets of weights uh, summing up to one. We want to make sure that the weights for the treated uh, outcomes are non-negative. Uh, mm -hmm. And then we have two additional restrictions um, that essentially work to remove the unit fixed the dependence of the unit fixed effects uh, by ensuring that the sum of the, the weights uh, over all periods for all values of w and the support uh, for all uh, k by by insisting that that sums to one we remove any dependence of the estimator on the fixed effect we, we essentially difference that out in the same way uh, we have a restriction that that deals with the time fixed effect. Uh, we say that for any time period, uh, the sum over k, the, the pi times the weight, sums to uh, to zero. And so, given these four restrictions, we define uh, w uh, with index outcome to be the set of all weights that satisfies these uh, these restrictions. Uh, and kind of the first uh, result is that if we have an, if we given that outcome model that I just described, if we use a set of weights inside this uh, set W outcome, then the estimator is consistent for some average effect that is a convex uh, combination of the tau i t. And so. I'm not characterizing here ex the, exactly what, what that particular average is, but it's going to give us a valid uh, causal effect. It's going to give us some weighted average uh, causal effect with non-negative uh, weights. And that's sort of um, sufficient kind of for, for what we're trying to do here. We're not necessarily trying to get the overall average effect. That would be a, a much bigger challenge. Uh, we want to just get some well-defined uh, average effect, uh, sort of in line, kind of with some of the the recent difference in differences literature uh, by people like uh, Goodman Bacon and Pedro Santana, where they look at uh, in, um, 
settings where difference in differences gives you gives you a well defined uh, average effect. Now, given that uh, set of the set of weights uh, and that set of restrictions on these weights, uh, I want to do the same thing for the for the assignment model. Uh, and so, at a high level, we're going to assume that there's some s some function of the assignment such that the conditional on that set, conditional on that uh, statistic uh, S, the assignment is independent of this unobserved characteristic. And so this S kind of gives us some unconfoundedness type uh, assumption that removes all the, the biases with comparisons between treated and, uh, and control units. Uh, and so in the earlier example, the, I assume that the average uh, the fraction of uh, treated parrots was going to work at, as, uh, for that uh, purpose. And then we could compare different units uh, as long as they had the same fraction of, uh, of treated, uh, treated parrots. I'm going to come back to kind of more complex settings, how you would choose uh, as where we come from. But let's, let's first look at uh, what we can do once we have such a uh, sufficient statistic uh, as and kind of to, to make this more concrete, kind of you can think of uh, S being something like the fraction of, uh, of treated periods. Actually, let me skip this for a second. So if the, the S satisfies that the sufficient statistic condition, then the assignment is independent of the potential outcomes given uh, that sufficient statistic. And we can compare treated and control units uh, with the same value of, uh, of S. And so now that allows us to construct a set of weights uh, that satisfies this set of conditions. Uh, and any set of weights in that, uh, in that set is going to lead to a consistent estimator for some average effect. Uh, so that gives us the second. Uh, the, the result, the formal result in the paper. If we have a design model that uh, allows for such an S, then if we use a set of weights uh, in, the, in the corresponding set uh, W uh, design, then that gives us a consistent estimator for some convex combination of, uh, of the tau IT. And so, now we want to combine these uh, uh, these two, and we're going to look at weights that are in both the design set and in the outcome set. We're going to apply those weights uh, to the average outcomes, and uh, as long as either the design or the outcome model is correct, then this is going to give us a convex combination of the individual treatment effects uh, tau it. And so that's that's kind of the the key result. Given an outcome model and a design model, we now have a way of constructing the, a set of estimators that is valid under the, either of those. And if if the set is non-empty, we can do so. If the set contains more than one elements, we're going to look for the set of uh, weights that the, has the lowest the sum of squared weights to uh, to optimize for precision uh, but it gives us uh, one of these double doubly robust uh, estimators now um, let me just go back briefly kind of to these two examples uh, to give you some idea where these uh, the sufficient statistics may come from uh, so if in kind of uh, the lit the IO literature uh, on dynamic uh, uh, models, you often see models for the, the process of, uh, of these interventions uh, of this type. And so here kind of is a very specific one where we assume that uh, the assignment in period T is independent of the assignment in future periods conditional on this unobserved component and conditional on the on the past, then that in turn allow, allows us to um, 
develop a model for the, the log odds ratio for the probability of uh, the, of this as a function of the, 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 the functional forms on the, on the UI. And so now in this, uh, this particular setting, the sufficient statistic would correspond to the sum of the WIT, the sum of the, the number of changes in the treatment between period T minus one and period T and the, both the first and the last uh, period assignment. <laughs> and so under this type of model, and you can use a different uh, version of these things, but under this type of model, it tells you that what makes these units comparable in their unobserved characteristic at least in a distributional sense, is conditioning on some set of uh, functions of the assignment. Uh, and here it's kind of both the total number of uh, assignments to the treated period, what the assignment was in the first and last period, as well as the number of changes uh, in, uh, in treatment. So you know, compare units that change treatment status equally often rather than had very different patterns in, uh, in, in changes. Another uh, setup, uh, and this is uh, somewhat related to kind of Bartic instrument uh, type uh, uh, methods. Uh, suppose that the assignment depends on a latent index crossing some threshold, uh, and suppose that that the latent index is a function of the unobserved component as well as uh, the time-specific uh, known aggregate uh, shocks. And in a very simple case where this is just uh, a constant, we would be back in this case where uh, the sufficient statistic would be the, the, just a fraction of treated uh, periods. But more generally, the sufficient statistic would be the sum of all periods of the, the, the psi t. So it would be a weighted uh, average of these uh, the, of the WITs, uh, and that would give us a sufficient statistic that would satisfy uh, this uh, this condition, and then would allow us to uh, to create this set uh, uh, W uh, design. And so, uh, let me just pause here for a second. In the end, what we, we what, what we're proposing, uh, what we're uh, trying to do in this paper is uh, make the case that thinking about the assignment model as well as uh, the outcome model can lead us to estimators that are more robust than uh, methods that, uh, that focus on, uh, on models for the outcome um, only. Now, obviously this only works if this set, the WDR is, is not empty, uh, and that's sort of where we need this, uh, this overlap assumption. If it is not empty, we look for that set uh, for the estimator that has the, the smallest um, set of sum of squared weights, and that that essentially corresponds to doing the doing weighted uh, doing a weighted estimation of the the outcome model. Then, um, uh, under those conditions, we can uh, we can get properties for the the resulting estimator. These weights end up converging. So that if we, as uh, we get more and more units and keep the number of time periods fixed, these weights co uh, converge to limiting uh, values, uh, and we get we can get um, asymptotic normality for the, the resulting uh, estimator, where we can uh, do inference based on the on the bootstrap. Now um, I have five minutes left here, so let me kind of just illustrate this uh, very briefly where we uh, the illustration actually uh, uses treatments that are non-binary and so the conceptual extension uh, there means that what we need to do is build a model for the conditional distribution of w uh, given the unobserved component uh, that has an exponential family form given that exponential family form the SI are going to play the role of this sufficient statistic. Uh, and so what we're going to do is uh, now build the outcome model, but adjust in a flexible way for these, uh, these assets, either through, uh, through weighting, 
to balance them uh, or through just the, the, directly to modeling the outcomes in terms of the the of the SI playing exactly the same role as this uh, the sufficient statistics uh, did in the in the binary case. And so here in the paper we kind of go into more detail here. We uh, we illustrate this with a the, the application from a paper by Charles and Stevens, uh, where they're interested in uh, relating, looking at the effect of uh, of the economic environment on the uh, on turnout uh, kind of as a measure of uh, political preferences. They have data on a, a number of a large number of counties, about three thousand, for a number of uh, presidential elections. Uh, they have these aggregate shocks uh, that uh, affect different counties more or less depending on uh, on their exposure to uh, the, the to energy to these prices through their their the share of. Uh, of various industries uh, that are more or less sensitive to uh, gas and coal prices. So what they uh, what the authors actually do, what the Charles and Stevens do, is uh, use a two-stage least squares uh, approach. What we do instead is uh, estimating a model that uh, relates the the wages to the, the economic environment. Uh, to this, to the exposure to uh, gas and coal prices, to the share of different industries in uh, in these counties, uh, and so we end up with a sufficient statistic uh, that uh, is the average of the uh, of the wages, kind of multiplied uh, uh, on its own, as well as uh, multiplied by uh, gas and coal the uh, the prices. And then we uh, condition on this in the outcome model as a way of flexibly adjusting for these uh, these sufficient statistics. Uh, and so it actually ends up giving us estimates uh, that are relatively uh, similar to those in the, the Charles and uh, uh, Stephen's paper. Uh, but where instead of uh, relying on a two-stage least squares uh, strategy, we directly try to adjust for these um, these unobserved components, both through the design and through the the outcome model. And so, then uh, the last thing we do in the paper, let me kind of just sort of briefly uh, uh, show that uh, we do some simulations uh, based on this data set, uh, where we generate the data to actually satisfy uh, this model. So we build a model for the outcome that depends on the unobserved component as well as has has time. Uh, Effects uh, the same for the the, the treatment. Uh, we allow for very flexible the uh, the treatment effect. Uh, then we, we estimate it on the original data and then uh, use that to get to as the data generating process uh, where we uh, vary the the degree of selection to kind of make the make it more challenging for the for the fixed effect uh, model. And so what we see in that case is that uh, the double robust estimator does, does relatively well, does, does just as well as the two-way fixed effect model in the case where there's no selection, uh, but it does much better in the case where there's a lot of selection, uh, where the two-way fixed effect model has a very hard time uh, 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 dealing with the, the adjustment by doing it only through the, through the outcome model. And that's just purely coming from the fact that it has a lot more bias in the, in that case. So let me uh, then end here. Kind of, um, there's a bunch of things we do here in this this paper, but really the the overall message is that uh, in these panel data settings, we typically uh, focus on modeling the outcome uh, process only. We kind of we build these uh, these often complex models, trying to find ways of uh, of removing uh, biases through removing dependence on uh, on permanent individual components. Uh, but from the cross section evaluation literature, there's a sense that modeling the assignment mechanism can also help in uh, in removing biases. And we lay out kind of a general doubly robust approach where we try to model both the, and 
the hope that that uh, leads to estimators that uh, that work well as long as either of the two models is uh, is correct. And so the big picture message is that even in these panel data cases, it's very helpful to think about the assignment process uh, and not just focus on the on the outcome model. And doing so kind of can lead to uh, sort of in principle kind of creates this class of estimators uh, that is much uh, bigger than the set of estimators that is valid only under the outcome model and allows us to get uh, more robust and more precise uh, estimators. All right. That, that is it. Um, let me stop here and um, see we allow for any questions at this point or what? what um, Uh, there, there are no questions in the keynote. Okay. I mean, Oliver could ask a question. <laughs> Is it putting Oliver on the spot? Lorenzo, actually, we have uh, two econometricians here. You're muted. Yeah. Uh, well, I already asked my question. <laughs> Uh, if so, this this um, double robustness thing is uh, seems applicable where you have a model about so you have two parts, two different models basically that you're uh, considering. So in other situations, we may just want to. It seems kind of counterintuitive in a way that if you specify more, that you can be robust to a broader set of circumstances. <laughs> Yeah, so, 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 and in some sense that, that came up in the earlier literature in the, the sort of in the cross-section setting as well, uh, people focus on these estimators that only estimated the conditional means or only estimated the propensity score, because trying to do both seemed like a harder problem. But there, as well as in, in this case, it turns out that the error really comes from the product of the the error in estimating one and the error in estimating two. So think about just a linear regression, the omitted variable bias. The omitted variable bias comes from the product of the coefficient on the omitted variable and the correlation between the omitted variable and the variable, yeah, the included one. And so these double robust methods just say, well, let's try uh, get rid of the correlation between the omitted variable and uh, included one and let's try to to get rid of the the effect of the omitted variable so in some sense the same way in in uh, robinson's sem semi parametric estimator where you uh, estimate where you residualize the outcomes as well as the 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 variables that enter linearly you residualize both with respect to to the nuisance uh, variables you do better than if you just residualize one of them. And so at, at, at a high level, it's, that's what, what it's doing here as well. And so not using, you know, building a model for the assignment, if that's wrong, obviously if it's very wrong, it's not gonna help you very much, but as long as it works a little bit, it's going to reduce the, the sensitivity of the results to, to the choice of the outcome model. And so for example, if you, you know, if you using kind of just a two-way fixed effect model, you may end up comparing a unit that is treated in one period with another unit that's never treated. And you would actually think that those units are probably quite different in terms of their unobserved characteristics. Uh, and you may be better off saying, well, I want to compare a unit that's treated in this period with a unit that's not treated in this period, but they're both treated 80% of the time overall, because that sort of is likely to make them more similar. And so that's going to reduce, no, it doesn't matter if your two-way fixed effect model is exactly correct, but in practice, you're not really sure about that. And you may uh, do better by, by comparing units uh, that are relatively similar. Yeah, thank you. So are there, 
So uh, should we close the session? Uh, okay. All right. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, great to see you. Conference. Great to see you guys. Uh, thank thanks you for, for thank having you, me. Thank you, for taking the time. Oh, much appreciated. Uh, thanks, yeah. Oliver. Glad, glad to be here. Thank you very much, guys. Bye. Um, have a good day. Bye. Bye.